Hello, it's Scott Manley here. For the last 20 years, the International Space Station has orbited above the Earth, and as it's been built out and inhabited, it has become a home away from home for diplomats, hustlers, on no wait, that's Babylon 5. No, it, it has become a destination in low Earth orbit. It's been the primary destination for all humans launching from the Earth since its construction, with the exception of a few free-flying shuttle flights, and of course all the launches by the Chinese Human Spaceflight Program. As of August 2020, there have been over 200 space flights to the International Space Station, 98 of which visited with crew on board and the rest carried cargo. And there have been a handful of failures which were supposed to go but failed to leave the atmosphere, or in some cases got to orbit but could not rendezvous and dock with the space station. So I wanted to actually go through all the different spacecraft that have visited the space station over its life. So the first component of the space station was the Zarya module, which launched in November 1998 on a Proton rocket. Now, obviously this doesn't count as a visit, but anything that's subsequently docked with it is what I'm considering a visit. And the first visitor would be the Space Shuttle Endeavour. STS-88 launched in December 1998, just less than a month later, and it brought up the Unity module and a crew, so they had to dock the two spacecraft together, producing the first international part of the International Space Station. After docking, they performed an EVA to ensure exterior connections between the two modules were performed. And once that was done, they could open up the hatch and enter into the Unity module and then enter into the um, Zarya module. And to reflect the fact that this was supposed to be an international collaboration, the hatch was opened and both the commander Robert Cabana and uh, Sergei Krikalov, the cosmonaut, they both moved through the hatches simultaneously in a, you know, demonstration of unity. So yeah, STS-88 got to appreciate that whole new space station smell and check some stuff out. But none of the crew stayed behind because, of course, they had to all leave with the space shuttle. At this point, there was no return vehicle. But the Space Shuttle was the largest and most capable vehicle to visit the Space Station. Over the life, there were 37 visits by the Space Shuttles, there were 12 visits by Endeavour and Atlantis, and 13 by Discovery. Columbia never got the upgrades needed to dock to the Space Station, so it, of course, went off and did its own thing, which uh, ended in 2003 when it was lost. Most of the visits by the Space Shuttle carried large components for the Space Station construction, Almost all the modules on the space station were launched by the space shuttle with maybe with a handful of which weren't. There were a few space shuttle flights which were uh, centered around delivering cargo and they used something called a multipurpose logistics module which was a large space station module in the payload bay. It would get picked out by the robot arm, docked to the space station or berthed to the space station where it would then get unloaded by the crew. Uh, towards the end they upgraded one of these modules with extra shielding and it was delivered on STS-133 and permanently berthed to the station. The Leonardo module is still there today. So chronologically, the next type of spacecraft to visit the space station was the Zvezda module, which I say visit with air quotes because of course it was launched in a proton rocket and docked to the back of Zarya and it remains there to this day. In August of 2000 it was the first visit by a Progress spacecraft and Progress cargo spacecraft uh, have launched to the space station more than any other type of spacecraft. There's been something like 70 launches, depending upon how you count them. The very first uh, delivery was a Progress M1, which was specially designed as a fluid carrier, or a fuel carrier, so it could refuel the Zvezda module for orbit maintenance. But most of the launches have been on Progress M and program Progress MS. So these date from the Mir era and the MS was an upgrade in 2015 which added new computers, new communications capabilities. The Progress can deliver 2600 kilograms of cargo and it has 7.6 cubic meters of internal stowage space. When it returns to Earth, everything burns up. It's not designed for downmassing. Although they had that capability in the Mir era, I don't think it's ever been used on the ISS. There were two custom versions of the Progress, the MS-01, which delivered the Piers airlock and docking module, and the MIM-2, which delivered the Poisk airlock. 
In both these cases, the cargo module was replaced by the space station module that was being launched and the service module was what carried it into space. The Progress has also seen updates to the Soyuz rocket that launched it. They always got the upgraded Soyuz first because they wanted to test it without crew on board. So while they just switched the Soyuz crew vehicle over to the 2.1A booster, Progress has been flying on that booster design since 2014. So Progress continues to fly and therefore is the spacecraft that's been flying to the space station most and longest. So now moving forward to October 2000, that was when the first Soyuz carrying a crew launched to the space station. Soyuz TM-31 carried Yuri Gutsenko, Sergei Krikalev and uh, William Shepard or Bill Shepard and they became Expedition 1. They were the first crew to actually stay on the space station for an extended period of time. There had been a handful of shuttle launches prior to this but those were all short visits. So there's been a permanent human presence in space since October of 2000. The Soyuz has been the second most prolific spacecraft visiting the space station. There have been 60 visits by the Soyuz with crew on them. There's been a single visit by a test Soyuz which didn't have any crew on board but instead carried the robot Fyodor. Or Fedor, yeah, and there was a Soyuz launch which uh, unfortunately failed to get to the space station. The Soyuz can carry a crew of three to and from the space station and it can also bring back about 70 kilograms of payload if necessary. The Soyuz has also been responsible for carrying space tourists to the space station and while that stopped recently it's going to restart and uh, we're expecting some more tourist flights from the Soyuz and from Dragon in the, the next few years. Like the Progress, the Soyuz has also evolved. Uh, it started out with the, the Soyuz TM for the early flights, then it became the TMA, the TMA-M, and now the MS. And now the latest MSs are flying on the Soyuz 2.1A booster, which is now fully digital and amazing. So, fast forward to 2008, we get the debut of the European ATV, the Automated Transfer Vehicle. These launched on the Ariane 5 from, of course, Kourou. And they were the largest cargo ships to the space station. They at launch, they were something like 20 tons. There were five of them, all given cute names like, you know, Jules Verne or Albert Einstein. And uh, they could carry 7.6 tons to the space station. They had 48 cubic meters of volume. These were massive vehicles. So yeah, they docked onto the Soyuz style docking adapter on the Russian section. And after they'd launched five of them, Europe said that they had basically fulfilled their commitment to the space station, but then with the extension of the space pr uh, station program, they apparently couldn't build any more, at least they had the parts, but they didn't want to fly them. So Europe's commitment to the space station was transferred to the Orion program, where the service module for the ATV is being adapted into the service module for the Orion spacecraft. The next visitor on the list was the Japanese HTV, the H2 transfer vehicle. And this was launched on their H2 rocket from the Tagishama Space Center. It's also known as Konotori, which is White Stork. The idea that the White Stork will be delivering joyous gifts to the space station. The first flight of this was in September 2009, and the final flight just left the space station uh, earlier this month, or in August. So that was a total of nine flights, but they are going to continue to fly. They're developing a new variant called the HTV-X. The HTV could carry up to six tons of cargo. There was a pressurized section at the front, giving them 14 cubic meters of volume, and then an unpressurized section where they could put other hardware. There were also attempts to use a recovery capsule in this because it would normally burn up, but they could have a small capsule in the door which after the thing was had left the space station, they could basically jettison the hatch into space and it would then re-enter and be recovered. And they did do this on at least one flight. The HTV berthed to the international side of the space station using the, the manipulator arm. That meant that they could carry large you know, racks and things like that as well. Fast forward now to 2012, and that sees the first commercial visitor, the Dragon 1 capsule. This wasn't the... Uh, first CRS mission. This was their test to demonstrate that SpaceX could in fact fly a spacecraft to the space station. And again, the Dragon 1 used berthing. They would tra visit a total of 20 times carrying cargo. They um, 
had six tons payload again, 10 cubic meters of pressurized volume, but they also had 14 cubic meters in the trunk. And it was the most capable vehicle in terms of down mass. They could land up to three tons of cargo with it. The Dragon also delivered some components to the outside of the space station. The international docking adapters for PMA 2 and 3, and uh, the Bigelow expandable activity module, the inflatable module which is currently used as a storage closet. Dragon 1 has retired, but Crew Dragon, of course, has visited the space station twice, once carrying Ripley, once carrying Bob and Doug, and it's going to continue to fly and later in the year, we expect to see the debut of Cargo Dragon 2. Unlike Dragon 1, this will not berth. It'll dock to a pressurized mating adapter, which does actually mean that it limits the size of cargo that can be unloaded through that hatch. In September of 2013, we saw the second commercial uh, cargo vessel, the Cygnus. This was developed by Orbital Sciences Corporation. And again, like the Dragon 1, it would be berthed. The, uh, some cool stuff about this is that it was much larger, I guess, than the Dragon. They could only carry three tons of payload. The initial versions could only carry two tons, but after the accident that destroyed the rocket, they switched their rocket over and they were then able to carry 3.3 tons. After it departs the space station, these things actually stay in orbit and they perform various experiments. The Cygnus has made 14 visits to the space station and it will continue to do so as part of CRS-2. And now looking to the future, there are a few other spacecraft we expect to be paying visits. There's the CST-100 Starliner, which was supposed to visit in December, but it got lost on the way to the space station. Um, there is the Dream Chaser, which is part of CRS-2. That will launch on a Vulcan next year. And there's the Nauka Lab, which is finally getting prepared for launch. This will be the third major component on the Russian side of the space station. And I'm looking forward to that. And Russia right now, I think, is developing a, a new transport vehicle called the Soyuz GVK, which is supposed to be able to return cargo to the surface of the Earth. There's actually quite a few different cancelled projects, like Clipper. The Orion capsule was originally supposed to go to the space station, but, of course... That was cancelled after it was pointed out by the time it was expected to fly, the space station program was supposed to be ended. And of course, in the early day of commercial transportation services, Kistler had their own spacecraft, which was going to launch the space station, but they were unable to raise the private funding, so their contract got uh, cancelled, and uh, Orbital Sciences ended up getting it and using it to develop the Cygnus. And while it would not be allowed for political reasons, I believe the Chinese uh, cargo spacecraft used for their space station has been designed to be able to use the international docking adapters on the International Space Station. So it's kind of amazing looking back over the history of this thing, how many spacecraft have visited it. And you know, the, the 100th flight of crew to the space station should actually happen later this year. It might well be the Dragon 2 Crew 1 mission will be the 100th crew to actually arrive at the space station, which would be kind of an amazing milestone. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.